In this video we'll look at the Heathkit QF1 Q multiplier. I'll review the history of the unit and its features and take a look at it inside and out. Earlier I made a separate YouTube video on a successor to this unit, the GD125, which is almost identical in features and operation to the QF1. So I refer you to that video for more details on what a Q multiplier is. In brief, it's a circuit that improves the selectivity of a radio receiver. For narrow bandwidth signals like CW or Morse code, this can allow you to hear the one signal you're interested in and filter out others. Or null out or suppress a signal nearby in frequency that's interfering with the station you want to listen to. While they were built into some high-end radio receivers of the past, Heathkit sold the QF1 and later similar models as an add-on to improve the performance of a basic receiver. The QF1 offered from 1956 to 1960 at a price of $9.95 was Heathkit's first Q multiplier. It was intended for use with the Heathkit AR1, AR2 and AR3 receivers, although it could be used with most radios that used a 455 kHz IF frequency. Housed in a metal case, it needs to obtain its filament and b power from the receiver it's attached to. The AR series of receivers provided an octal plug on the back for this. Most two-based radios of the era could be easily modified to provide the necessary voltages. It was followed by the HD11 offered from 1961 to 1964 at a price of $14.95, which used the same basic circuit but included a built-in AC power supply. The HD11 was replaced by the GD125 in 1966, which initially sold for $14.95 and was offered until 1971. It was essentially the same as the HD11, but repackaged in a different case and color scheme to better match Heathkit receivers like the GR64. All of these units were sold as kits that the user would assemble using the provided parts and a detailed assembly manual. Let's look at the front panel controls. The mode switch selects between off, sharp, null, and broad. When off, the attached receiver operated normally as if the Q multiplier was not present. In sharp mode, it operates as a narrow bandpass filter. The peak adjust control adjusts the level of regeneration and therefore the width of the filter. The tuning control adjusts the center frequency of the filter around the receiver's IF frequency. In null mode, it operates as a band reject filter, with the depth of the null controlled by the null adjust control and the center frequency by the tuning control. Broad mode is similar to sharp mode, but the filter has a wider bandwidth suitable for voice or music signals like commercial shortwave broadcasts. On the rear panel is a cable with an octal plug that connects to the receiver to pick up the high voltage B plus and tube filament voltage. The Heathkit AR series of receivers featured a suitable octal socket on the back to provide these voltages. Other radios could be modified. It requires either 6.3 or 12.6 volts AC and from 150 to 250 volts DC. The other cable is a shielded coax with a phono connector that would connect into the IF amplifier of the receiver. It required a receiver that used an IF frequency of approximately 455 kilohertz, which was common at the time. The QF1 kit included a suitable octal socket and phono plug to install in the receiver if it needed to be modified. The unit's housed in a metal case for shielding. It doesn't match the look of the AR3 receiver other than being mostly silver in color. It is similar in styling to some Heathkit transmitters of the time like the DX100. Inside you can see there's not a lot of circuitry with all wiring point to point. A small U-shaped chassis is attached to the front panel. The function switch and null and peak potentiometers are mounted on the front panel as well as the tuning capacitor which has a 7 to 1 vernier reduction drive. These vernier drives sometimes seize up, making it appear that they're not a reduction drive and only supporting one half a turn. Cleaning with a solvent will usually eventually free them up. On the chassis is a tube socket, two variable inductors, a trimmer cap, and a terminal strip. What looks like a variable inductor is a small 1 to 10 picofarad variable capacitor. The back houses the cables which exit via rubber grommets. 
It uses a single 12 AX7 tube, which is a dual triode, equivalent to two tubes. The tube in my unit says Heathkit by Mullard, an indication of the buying power that they had that they could have tubes branded for them by a major manufacturer. It's also almost certainly the original tube. The two inductors and trimmer cap are adjusted as part of the alignment procedure outlined in the manual. See my other video on the GD125 for more details. There are rubber feet on the bottom of the case. The unit would typically be placed on top of the receiver it was used with. I bought this unit in January of 2020 from a seller on eBay who was local and had obtained it as part of an estate. The price was attractive because there was no need to pay for shipping. For a unit that was built around 1960, it's in an amazingly clean and pristine state. It didn't come with a manual but was complete with the cables and all internal parts. I was able to find copies of the manual on the internet. The knobs are original. It's odd that the null and peak knobs don't have any pointers on them as this would have been useful for identifying the position, but for some reason Heathkit used these knobs. Strangely they used a knob with a pointer on the tuning control, which doesn't really serve any purpose as the vernier drive has a separate pointer. I started off the restoration by giving the internals a visual inspection and a light cleaning. As is typical for carbon composition resistors, they had all drifted high by about 10% in value, but this is acceptable. There are no wax paper or electrolytic capacitors, which are prone to failure over time, only ceramic and mica types, which tend to be good, so I left them in. I own a Heathkit AR3 receiver, which this unit was designed to work with. Wiring of the QF1 to the Heathkit AR3 is covered in a later 1961 edition of the QF1 manual. You need to wire it for 12.6 volt AC filament power as provided by the AR3 and connect the appropriate signals to the octal plug. My unit was not wired for an AR3 so I needed to rewire the octal plug pins. This indicates that it was used with some other type of receiver. Given the condition of the unit I have to wonder if it was used very much at all. When connected and powered on with the receiver, the unit worked as expected. I performed the alignment as per the manual, which doesn't require any instruments. I'm still amazed that this unit is over 60 years old. It looks like it could have been assembled yesterday. I wonder who built it sometime back before I was born and what receiver they used it with. Bob Eckweiler writes a monthly column for the Orange County Amateur Radio Club called Heathkit of the Month. The December 2010 issue, available online, has a nice article about the Heathkit QF1 Q multiplier. It provides a good explanation of the circuit and theory of operation. As mentioned, I've made separate videos on the similar GD125 Q multiplier and the Heathkit AR3 receiver shown here. The QF1 Q multiplier was an optional add-on for receivers like the AR3 that improved the selectivity of the radio, making it more suitable for use on amateur radio bands where signals tend to be more crowded together than on the shortwave broadcast bands. By making it an option, they kept the price of the receiver down and provided an opportunity to upsell the customer, possibly at a later date after the radio purchase. It's not clear how many people opted for it, but these units are relatively rare. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please check out my other YouTube videos on vintage amateur radio and test equipment.